Hey guys, welcome to this week's edition of Track Talk Thursday. This week I was lucky to sit down with Justin Knight, two-time NCAA champ at Syracuse, now runs and trains in Charlottesville, Virginia with Reebok, two-time uh, world championship finalist. I mean, his, his list of accolades, it goes on and on and on. So we got to talk about all those accolades, including breaking the uh, indoor national record in the 1500 for Canada this season, what it's like to run at BU. We got to talk about some of the struggles he's had as a pro, how he's bounced back and really recovered from those and is really clicking on all cylinders right now as a pro and uh, representing Canada at the highest level. It was a great conversation, and we got into some really cool things. We even got to talk to him about uh, just some of the things that he's faced as a black man growing up um, in Canada and now moving to the U.S. and what he faces even today in Charlottesville. And it was really eye-opening, um, some of the stories that he had to tell. Um, and I'm extremely grateful for him being able to, to tell those stories and, and share some of his experiences with us. The link will be down below for the Twitch channel. I go live Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, sometimes Friday or Saturday, just depending on what's going on with life and training. Um, but that description will be down below. Make sure to jump on over there. Join us for the next Track Talk Thursday. Come in and hang out with us when we're analyzing race videos, talking about training, um, just about everything track and field and video games we, we cover over there. And we have a really good community going. So I appreciate everybody's support so far. And I hope you enjoy this, this Track Talk Thursday with Justin. All right. Can you hear me, Justin? I can hear you. All right, I got you too. Uh, everybody got, everybody be able to hear Justin and I. And then um, I'm gonna leave that music on in the background. If it's okay, if it gets annoying, we can we can adjust accordingly. Um, dude, yeah, so we made some audio, right? Cause like, you know, I had Robbie on a couple weeks ago, so we made some adjustments. So we've just been trying to smooth out everything. We got everything going, um, but we got it now. We're good to go. Um, so I guess first official track talk where it's going to be legit here and, um, Justin Knight, um, hold on a second. Let me, uh, I have this like alert on, let me hide this so it doesn't keep going off while we're talking. Um, yeah. So Justin Knight, I mean, dude, I, Okay, so I was curious about this. I saw an article where it said you're the most decorated Syracuse runner of all time. Okay, <laughs> who el who else is like famous alumni from Syracuse running? Famous alumni from Syracuse. Well, at my time we had Freddie Crittenden. Okay, who, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Know him with training with Devin Allen and those guys on night. And um, who else we have? We have Jared Eden, who is also an NCAA okay. champion. Uh. On the women's side, Katie Fair is not sure exactly like in terms of NCAA titles and stuff, but we all know her from you know, going out there and doing her thing in the Olympics and repping USA really well. And uh, I think I, th I mean, those are the ones that like have kind of made their mark and you know, asserting some sort of dominance in the NCAA. But uh, I guess that that statement might be correct. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I it was hard to it's hard to argue with that. I mean, multiple time <laughs> NCAA champ, like everything you did for the university and the NCAA level, like. But I was just curious because like, it's so many Division One schools and there's so many professional athletes. You forget like who comes from where, without like going back and like oh. looking at it. So I was just like curious. No, we got but, some uh, rich history though. We have some good guys that good things in high school, uh, top recruits, even um athlete i know he's a coach now at eku but his name is Toronto, and he represented like team usa at world cross and like the best teams ever i think and i forgot exactly who was on that team but there's two syracuse guys on that like, and i heard that when i first got there i was like that's crazy like i thought i was a big deal representing canada <laughs> but had two guys on the usa nice but yeah, chat. So, uh, first live, uh, I guess we had Robbie on, but like the first official live guest, Justin Knight, um, just mentioned it, most decorated Syracuse grad, um, worlds in London and Doha, correct? In the 5k, um, right. made the, did you make the final in 2017 as well? Yeah, I did. Okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> I, I thought in when, there's a funny story about that. I'm sure we on it a little bit later, but, uh, 2017 out to london to watch they actually bought their ticket to go home after the semi oh like, my gosh to leave like right after the semi-final and then like some somehow i snuck my way into the final and they had to like rebook their tickets and stuff so that was a little bit that's funny that's funny um yeah so justin knight's on 
uh, two-time world champ qualifier, two-time finalist, decorated NC at Syracuse. And uh, we're also doing something special tonight with, uh, you're able to donate tonight um, directly through the stream. Um, there's a link um, down below. Also, if you hit the, uh, the donate command, I believe uh, it'll take you to it. Otherwise, um, and I believe the link is in the bio, but everything that gets donated tonight, um, including subs, um, we'll just go directly to the NAACP empowerment program and really want to just, we wanted to work together to kind of build something out of this. Um, I'm planning to make some kind of donation after this as well, um, uh, on behalf of Ari and I and, and everything that this is on the behalf of the stream and all that stuff, but everything tonight that gets donated, will go directly to that. Um, just trying to make that and we'll, we'll get more into that as we get going here. Um, but I figured we, we, we get started with a little track talk. We get started with a little off the track talk and then, um, We'll work our way into uh, some of the stuff going on with that. Um, but so like my first question for you is, and I've always wanted to ask you this and we've been, we've communicated a couple of times. You started running in 10th grade, right? Yeah. Okay. So why 10th grade? Why not ninth? Why not junior high? Why <laughs> not like not? Why, why did you start in 10th grade? Well, I mean, it's kind of funny. Like technically I've run track meets back in oh, being like maybe like the grade somewhere grade but you know more so i guess during that time like show off to the girls like how many ribbons do you get like i never really practiced for it just one of those like show up and do it and um i guess like 10th grade when i really started was uh i had a 68 in gym class which is kind of strange <laughs> for, <laughs> for any athlete like that i don't know like i was playing basketball i played volleyball on both I don't know and like i just had a 68 in gym class and then i asked my my gym teacher at the time i was just like they're like what's going on i can't bring these grades home my parents are gonna kill me especially like this is a uh course that i'm supposed to be thriving in it's supposed to be a pass um kind of explained to me that even though my team was winning in gym class and uh we were going to the finals i was scoring buckets in basketball badminton whatever you want we were playing uh, he said that my mark reflected the effort that I was making. So just because my team was winning doesn't mean that I was giving my full-fledged effort. So he thought it was fair. He thought that my effort reflected his state. And uh, later on, I, I mean, I, I kind of asked him in that moment. I was like, you know, how could I change this? And last unit left was running. And I was just like, okay, well, I think I'm a decent runner. Like, I, I don't ever feel like I'm gasping for air. So, uh, you know, practice in class, I'll just, I, I stay towards the front. Uh, but long story short, the running unit went well. I put the front class for like a And when it came down to it, to like the final test for that gym class, we had to run a, a annual 5K for graders. Um, ended up breaking like the school's record in that. And then, uh, like, all the gym teachers thought I was cheating. Like, them that was beside me on the bike. And then uh, there wasn't much of the track season left in grade 10. There was just the, you know, private school. And then uh, Toronto District Championship. And then our provincial championship. And uh, they convinced my mom to let me uh, back and field. Because I missed so many days of school that she, she was kind of fed up at that point. Let me do it. But uh, they convinced her to let me let me go, and uh, that's kind of just how I got started into running, I guess. Nice, dude. That, I mean, it's crazy how like Jim you was like taken so serious with Jim. Um, but yeah, so it's funny how like you needed to get into running because of a bad gym grade, almost like not because you mean, wanted my... to try it or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, my my school we we were known we were a private school, we were a Catholic school. And to be honest, we were a sports school. Like, we were in sports. Uh, like, fun fact, I don't know if you know this, but uh, we have the most graduates of any high school in the NHL. So, oh, we had really? Tyler Sagan. Yeah, man, we had, like, Tyler Sagan. I don't know if you've ever been to Tim Gordon's, but Gordon went to our school. Um, Jason Spezzo, like, I can I can list a bunch of guys, but um, they're notoriously known for hockey. At that point in time, when I well, we were the number one basketball team too, so uh, they take their athletics pretty seriously, I guess you could say. Nice, nice. That's funny. Yeah. 
Um, so prior to 10th grade, was it just basketball then for you pretty much? Is that what yeah. you like? You're just playing basketball? I played bas- basketball and volleyball. It was, well, I like both sports. Uh, I have an older brother. I don't know if you I did see that. Before. I saw where your, your brother played volleyball. Yeah. I was always like the younger brother, just kind of trying to follow his path and got me into volleyball. He was a provincial champ. I wasn't, but I enjoyed it. I wasn't as good as him. And, uh, I had a good time. Nice. So, okay. So obviously like you started, you were quote unquote, like late into the track. So like when you joined in 10th, like the guys, people you're running against were obviously like quote unquote experienced. Um, <laughs> But, like, do you have any, like, embarrassing or funny things that happened to you, like, while you're on the track or at a meet or something that was, like, uh, you, like, look back on and you're like, wow, I was, like, that was, like, pretty embarrassing as me as, like, a, Man, I, as a high school I have kid. A bunch, I feel like I have a bunch of stories. I, <laughs> I feel like uh, well, in the 10th grade specifically, I felt super out of place. From a basketball background, I was used to sports being, like, a little bit past my knees, if not, like, just right above. And, um... I remember showing up to the meet in my basketball shorts. I had like an Under Armour, uh, you know, like those t- the dry fit on, and I had my uniform on top of that. And uh, I remember lining up on the line. And I was running in. Uh, you'd appreciate this, but like Nike Hyperdunk, my basketball <laughs> shoes back in the day. So I was running in. I was running in those shoes, and I, I showed up, and like all these kids were just kind of like making fun of me, not like super rude or anything, but kind of like laughing and. Because like, you're running in basketball dead. shoes, yeah. And you're yeah. like, dude, what do you yeah, think man. you could run? What do you think you could run right now in a pair of Nike Hyper Dunks? What do you think you could run a mile in? Do you think you could break like, f- I don't know, four oh eight? I know for sure. Like, if I have a pacer, I could, maybe. I think like I think like pacers? it'd be like I think like four oh six would be like the Hyper Dunk like like pretty yeah. you're pretty good at like those shoes are not like light those shoes are not like <laughs> conducive to like running for a long period of time no but i mean it's it's almost like those jean miles and stuff like that where i think it's possible obviously i'm not gonna be running with basketball shorts on but yeah I, i'm sure they're a lot lighter now maybe you can talk to your boys at nike and something. have a hyper dunk <laughs> mile race all right so you obviously, we talked about it a little bit on the phone last night. We both kind of have like a, a pretty good love for the game of basketball, especially we follow the NBA. So I thought we'd play a little game here of uh, like your Mount Rushmore of current NBA basketball players. Okay. So we're going to pick okay. our top four. We're going to alternate back and forth. We're going to have a little debate here of what we think is our top fours. Um, I'll let you pick first. You pick one first, then I'll go. We'll go back and forth. So who is your like, who is your... Uh, no, we'll pick different players, and then we'll so we'll have eight okay. total, but we'll see. So who is your uh, who is your first pick of the Mount Rushmore of current NBA basketball players? And okay, do we want to go off? Do we want to go off favorite players? Or do we want to go off best players? Who we think is the best? And I know I know bear people are gonna get mad, but off the bat, by Leonard. You know, I, I I was I wanted to pick LeBron, but I'm sorry, man. That guy gave us gave the Toronto Raptors. I thought I would die before I saw the <laughs> Raptors win the championship. Like, just be serious. So I I'm gonna pick Kawhi Leonard. All you right, yeah. I Kawhi mean I'll take next. LeBron. Yep, I mean obviously I'll take LeBron. Um, okay. I think after um, this it becomes like a lot more of like personal preference. Like I think. I think there's a couple guys that'll be like right here that I, I think you should pick, but we'll see. Uh, I think some of the people that I pick might not have the best rep, but I feel like their heart like Yeah, yeah, like, I know what you're saying. I wanna pick I love Russell Wick. Alright, so Wade. I'll take Giannis. I think Giannis you I mean, take him. <laughs> dude, he's so good. Um but I'm gonna I'm gonna slide in here and I'm gonna take a third pick and I'm going to take uh, if you're gonna take Russ I'm gonna take Dame because I think yeah. Dame is I think Dame is better than Russ I mean he Dude. sent him home he rebuilt their entire franchise and pushed him out of OKC yeah you're I mean, right I'm, well I, I don't know if I agree with that point certified I mean seeing him kind of attack 
uh, Russ in that series and go against them, like, there's no doubt. Russ, to me, is just, like, so athletic and doesn't want to beat. I'm not saying that Dame does, but, like, Russ does not give a damn. Like, you saw when KD left, even though they're teammates. Even when Harden left, like, there's barely any interaction between them. So, I just feel like, for me, like, Russ would just so personal that he's not going to allow somebody to. So, that's why I pick Russ. Um, <laughs> So we have, uh, so I have three. You've got Russ and uh, I got him. I, I got a match Giannis. Going can guard him. Who'd you take? It cut out for a second. I'm gonna take Anthony Davis. All right, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Um, <laughs> I got an argument on Twitter about how Anthony Davis is ranked ahead of Damian Lillard with a bunch of Blazers fans. I'm like, Anthony Davis is better than Damian Lillard. Like, Anthony Davis brings more to a team than Damian does. Like right now, like. I, I, I'm not saying that in a few years Damian might not take over, but I would like put Anthony Davis ahead of Damian Lillard on like the all NBA list right now. It, I feel like with the bigs, it's, it kind of depends who you surround them with. Where if you have shooters on the outside or if you have someone that you know, uh, brings a lot of attention like LeBron, it kind of frees up the area for them. AD is talented, he's skilled, but I feel like that position, it's a lot easier to double team and it's a lot harder for or because of staying pace. But I feel like Dame, like a, a skater, where like off the dribble from a soon half court, like you might get a bucket. So I mean, it's debatable. I, I think AD yeah. is the right answer. AD is probably definitely the right answer. I'm, people are probably going to tell me that I don't know any basketball no more, but <laughs> I, I think I got like a week. Um, I got a hey. weakness card. Yeah. So uh, in your in your Discord app, um, go to your uh, like settings. If you if you click on like your bottom right corner where it's like your little like icon, and then hit voice, and then see if, if you change the uh, auto sensitivity and turn it off, and then turn the sensitivity all the way up. See if that'll help with like cutting in and out a little bit. those settings and then hit voice. voice and then turn off auto sensitivity and then turn that bar all the way up all right never mind i can't hear you now so hit hit back turn back on auto sensitivity is it good i didn't turn it off I don't okay even... yeah, yeah okay we'll see if it works it's like cutting in and out a little bit so we might just have to like slow down a little bit with your answers because like sometimes it like doesn't necessarily catch your whole answer uh oh do you want me to do external microphone built in or a default external microphone built i would in? do external because you're using the headphones so i switch that uh default headphones built in i'll just do headphones output volume all the way or no you're good yeah you should be good now you should be good okay. now all right that's cool I'm, All right, I'm sorry, so, guys. I hate to ruin this. I, no, you're good, my dude. First time. <laughs> you're good. Uh, so I think the last two people for me are like a toss up between uh, between uh, James Harden and Steph for me. Oh, okay. I think I think so like you, so you're gonna take those two. You can have you can have one or the other. I'll take the other. I mean, honestly, like I think they both Steph. are like. All right, I'll take James <laughs> then. That's fair. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. That's fair. Um. <laughs> I mean, real quick, we I can feel discuss like it right now. I disrespect Steph so much. I, I don't know if it's a level of disrespect. I feel like people kind of like aren't accepting of the way he's changing the game, per se. That they got bored. Like the first time when he came out and started hitting threes and doing all the sneaky sort of plays and stuff like that, like we were, you know, astounded from that. And then now they kind of just play it down like, oh, like, I don't know. I, I feel like they don't give him enough credit anymore. I agree. Like I, he, like, and and the guy in the chat just said Steph Curry changed the game of basketball, and like land on the loss of that. I mean, I agree. Like he changed it, and I feel like it was hard for people to accept the change. Like James Harden is like different than what's been in the last ten years, and like it's hard for people to like accept yeah. James Harden of like, if the game is like drive to the <laughs> basket, get a foul called, and get to the line, and get two free throws. Like, it don't matter how you get the ball in the basket as long as you're scoring points. He's taking like, five steps though. <laughs> if the NBA is gonna allow five steps, the NBA is gonna allow five steps. I mean. If you can run three steps on the white line 
in track and field and you run two, yeah. you're not, you're not, you're not disqualified. You know what I'm saying? Like they're, they're going to allow it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's okay. True. So the NBA is coming back now. Uh, they just hopefully said July 30th. Now they're trying to push it up. Who wins the title this year? Who wins the title this year? Uh, honestly, like I'm probably, probably going to pick like the Bucks. to be honest. I feel like their team overall, like the Bucks. Oh, don't even look at the Bucks, the Bucks dude. The Bucks, bro. Over over the Clippers team, and the Lakers. I don't think the Clippers have it, man. I'm not even concerned about the Clippers. Man, dude, they barely they barely play man. with each other. Like that's the thing. They barely. <laughs> sorry, they barely play with each other. Like, how many games has Paul George been on this on at the same time with Kawhi Leonard? Like, yeah, but no one's been playing for the last. No one's been playing for the last three months, so no one's gonna have chemistry. I guess so, but like you still don't know, know, like those... that's interesting. I think the Clippers have a better shot than the Lakers, to be honest. That's even I'm, I'm actually even more surprised. People, like I surprised. think the Lakers are clear favorites, dude. Like playoff dark mode, LeBron. Mm-hmm. Like LeBron has literally been in voluntary dark mode. Like his like zero dark thirty, he always does for the playoffs. Like he's been in like <laughs> he's been in like mandatory dark mode for the last three months. That dude is gonna come out of quarantine like the absolute freak athlete, even more freak than what he is before. That's his teammates though. I feel I like know. he has a bunch of goofs on his team. Hey, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, LeBron, no, LeBron carries. I mean, LeBron carries. All right, let's yeah. get back to some track talk. We've kind of, like, <laughs> it's all good. I mean, the Lakers are going to win. We I feel like I'm, at, I'm in high school again, and I'm back at the lunch table. Oh, are you good about it? <laughs> before exactly. I have to go to class. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, so we talked about it before a little bit, um, about your two world championship races and uh, yeah. qualifying for the final in both and sneaking in in, in 2017. Um, I'm going to go back to a race where we kind of brought it up in the, in the prior conversation about the Stumptown race when you kicked out kicked Galen in 2018. Mate. <laughs> Take us through a little bit about like like the couple days prior to that race, kind of what you were thinking, like going into that race, like where you were at, yeah. just kind of like, and then like sum it up real quick here and like see what see what it says. Yeah, man. So, like, basically, so I keep playing with the camera angles because I'm, I'm just trying to get that that perfect lighting. That perfect, but, <laughs> that perfect glow. That perfect glow. Yeah, I'm not. This is actually my girlfriend's office. This is our spare bedroom, but it's my girlfriend's office because she works from home. So, I'm usually not in here. Like, she has two desktops set up, but, like, for me, like, I'm not in here at all. So, I didn't really have enough time to play around with the lighting. But, um, yeah, back to your question. I, I'll never forget. So, I came off of. CAA's, of course, it was back in 2016. And that whole year for me, like, I was doing well that year, but I haven't hit my goal. Like, I just missed uh, achieving the Olympic standard at Peyton Jordan that year. Um, funny story that came with that one, but like, I'm not staying up to download Drake's album till three o'clock in the morning anymore. That's not going to be a thing before, <laughs> before race days and stuff like that. So, uh, no excuses though but like that's just a funny thing that happened then but um even like at ncaa's uh i don't remember what place i got i feel like it was somewhere between like 9th and 13th or something like that and i didn't have the race that i i should have had um that year and uh i'll never forget like my coach he we had a meeting i was back at syracuse pretty much the whole team was home just because it was almost like summer vacation and stuff like that and um, I just remember sitting in his office and he was just like, Justin, like, you know, you don't have the standard. Um, you know, we didn't do horrible at NCAAs, but we didn't do exactly what we wanted to do. And he's like, I can understand if your body's tired, like, but there's a one race that like I'm talking with people and they're setting it up to go like decently fast. And, you know, you let me know if you want to end your season now. OK, or if you want to keep going and try for that Olympic standard one more time. Uh, let me know and uh, the meeting went well I kind of told him that I want to try for the standard again because as you can appreciate with you know different situations in life like you can try and fail at something but if you don't try at all you already failed so like to me I I just felt like I had nothing to lose and um, I went to that race I flew out with my assistant coach uh, Adam Smith who's also my assistant coach right now here at Reebok and um, I was with my teammate, Adam Palomar. He was running the 1500. 
And um, I remember right before the race, like Coach Foxy called me because he stayed back in Syracuse. He had his own obligations there. And um, I'll never forget what he told me. He, he called me and he said, Justin, you know what? Like, I feel bad for you in a sense because you've ran some pretty impressive times. You've ran fast this year, but we've just been focusing on getting that one time, that one standard, and you didn't achieve it. So even though, you know, you accomplished so much this year, you haven't had that feeling of success because you always just missed out on that one time. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and then like for me, like that's exactly kind of the way I was feeling. And uh, Coach Fox, like the way he kind of finished that call, he said, you know, either way, I'm super proud of you, buddy. Like you're a sophomore at the end of the day. Like how many sophomores can say that, you know, they've ran the times or put themselves in a position that that you have. And he told me, he was like, to be honest, like, I don't know who's showing up for this race. I don't care if Galen's there or if other pro runners are there. We use Galen because Galen was like, you know, he was the man. And yeah. uh, he was the one that was being advertised as being there. But like, we weren't sure what if he, he was run. coming or not. Yeah. yeah. And um, so he said, like, we don't care who shows up. Um, he told me, he's like, I want you to do one thing that you've always been really good at that we haven't done in a while. And he said, I want you to win that race. He said, I don't care if you run 1408 and I don't care if you run 1320, but when you're in that race, you got to win. Like that's the main goal. And, um, kind of throughout that race, like, I don't remember it all too vividly to be honest, but, uh, the last lap, I think I remember, remember Galen making a move with like maybe 500 to go. And he kind of separated himself from, you know, the pack and, uh, I think with 400, I tried to kind of close that gap with him. And I think he had like maybe 10 or 20 meters on me. And um, I was just like, okay, let me just try to close this. Like I might not beat him, but let me just at least try to finish with him. And then um, I think there was 250 left or 200. And I was finally like right on his back. And then uh, with 200 meters to go, I was just like, you know what? Screw it, man. Like, let's just go. Like this guy's a world-class guy. Like if I beat him or if he beats me, like, it's just a great situation overall. And um, I was just able to edge him out. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately for me, but unfortunately for him, um, <laughs> I was able, able to edge him out on the line. And um, I was so close. I was just like a couple milliseconds off that standard, but um, it, it just felt good to just win a race with good company and great competition. The fans were like in lane right two. There, yeah. 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 So it was a great feeling, man. I'm pretty sure you were at that, race too you I, did you run like the 1500 or something or am i thinking of a different 2018 would have been it's 16 uh 16 i ran the 15 there yeah yeah because i remember you were there i think yeah 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 so you had that race and i feel like the one thing that like i take away from that that i can relate to drastically is like when you're at that level of like the collegiate racing with the pros, you just have zero to lose. Zero like you just stick lose. your nose in there and like exactly what you're saying, like with 200 to go, you're like, if I beat him, like I have all to gain and he has everything to lose. Like, and now yeah. as a pro, you step on the line, you're like, dude, I have everything to lose. And he's like, young kids have like nothing to lose. Like now you're in that situation <laughs> like, where you're just like, dude, if I lose to like some kid from wherever now, I'm like, oh, I'm yeah. not going to hear the end of this. Like, dude, pro track is going to berate yeah. you. <laughs> Like teammates are going to berate you. Coach is going to be on you. Like, it's like, yeah. Okay. So yeah. the other race I would talk about was, um, was your, your indoor race this season when you broke the Canadian national record, the 15 at BU. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. so like you're obviously like, and we, we're, we can get into it a little bit more here in a little bit about kind of like the, we kind of want to talk about a little bit about like, bouncing back from some of the struggles you had as like a pro. And one of those bounce backs was obviously world's the end of last season into like yeah. this, this indoor season where you really started to accelerate the your 15 um what's it like to race at bu what's it right to feel like to have that canadian <laughs> national record i've never actually raced at bu surprisingly like, i've never Bro, been there so i will stand BU here and say that the the uh, track is 190 <laughs> meters until i race on it and when i race on it it'll be 200 no no but me- what's it like what's it like to have that to have that canadian national record to really bounce back and, and have that have that strength of the 15 now and also be able to show that you can compete with the best in the world at the 5k i'm surprised you haven't raced there first and foremost like <laughs> that is the magic track bro like it is I, I don't know any which way to describe it it feels like you're running on a trampoline to be honest uh 
it might be more of a trampoline than it is a 190 meter track but uh <laughs> it is it is a phenomenal track um the atmosphere there is great obviously uh, to be honest my school was in the northeast so uh we would often travel to bu when i was in college just because it was one of those meets that we can travel by bus instead of taking a plane save some expenses and stuff like that so um yeah that race for me it was great um earlier on this season prior to covid and you know when everything was kind of normal uh, i would like to say that to be honest i was in like the best shape of my life um that whole season the whole indoor season and um i feel like i was in a good spot too where i didn't i didn't dive down into the well in any sort of race like obviously i i put the effort forth and like i was racing and it was hard but like i didn't you know hit that sort of wall where you're just gassed after and you feel like man i have nothing else to give so um i was really proud of that season um i i think after that race like to be honest i didn't even know like i, I crossed the finish line um you know the bowerman guys had their their own race set up earlier on in the day and uh, um I, I was trying to run a time kind of similar to what uh josh ran but um you know i, I was a couple seconds off but um yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of finished that race and I was just like, oh, whatever. Like I ran fairly fast, but like I didn't, you know, run as fast as, as Thompson did. And um, I remember I was talking to Matt Hughes after a, a different race was going on, but I was just getting ready to cool down. And I was talking to Matt Hughes for a little bit, congratulated him on his Olympic standard and stuff in the 5K. And then he, he asked me, he's like, oh man, how does it feel for you to officially have your first like senior Canadian record? And I'm like, what <laughs> and, he just, and then he was just like yeah you know that you got the record and i was just so confused but um it was a great feeling like um you know we have guys like mo ahmed uh you have great guys in the f of 1500 and you know mo's make it really tough to kind of get these records he's, he's not only you know making them tough as a canadian but anybody if you're american or you know at the world level like the times that he's running is just remarkable so um just for me to kind of capture something for my own uh, was just a really great accomplishment, uh, just kind of to, to set the tone for the rest of the year. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's tough because like exactly what you said, like you're in the best shape of your life and then everything happens. <laughs> and I feel like yeah. the topic of like this season has been like berated into the ground. So like, I don't want to like yeah. really like get into it, but like, how has life oh, been in, like how has life been in quarantine like have you still trained at a high level did you take time off are you like are you fat on junk food now like like what are what are you, where are you at in kind of training right now and like what what should we expect for yeah. just tonight in the fall whether there's races or not we'll say like you can run time trials on your own or not like what do we expect from just tonight in yeah. a couple months when like you can actually get back outdoors and start really starting to push yourself man like first and foremost i'm surprised you didn't compliment me on my little goatee that i have going here but <laughs> i didn't know if it was a compliment a... or like laziness like I, like i had so many beers during quarantine and it wasn't because i like i was like proud of him it's just because like i didn't feel like shaving and i'm like i'm not going anywhere like why does it matter a little bit of both where i, I don't feel like shaving it but then i got to a point where i was just like let's see how let's see how long we can grow this i have to say you look like a grown man dude you look like a grown man <laughs> Thanks, man. So, I mean, when I start racing, this is all coming off. This is this has literally been like five months, <laughs> six months of work. So, you know, I don't expect it to get too much longer or anything. I think I've almost reached my max. But, um, yeah, I mean, with this whole COVID situation, to be honest, um, I know that I, I'm not like a huge germaphobe to begin with, but I have 100% have been taking things above and beyond and kind of overboard. Um, I haven't practiced with my teammates in five months six months maybe i mean i haven't practiced with them since february or maybe uh early march actually um i haven't eaten out at a restaurant since march Ari and i, I did today uh, for the first time by ourselves oh really how was we've it? been to uh like ari's aunt was in town to help us move and then my mom was in town to like help us move in and we went to yeah. shake shack and we went to this little pizza place but it was like the four of us like we so I, we've been in like two restaurants with people but like today was like the first time like Ari and i went to brunch like and sat at a restaurant and at one point we looked up and there was like no one else in the restaurant and we're like hey we like social distancing you know like at its finest yeah. like but it was were nice guys... it's like that feeling where you get to order off a menu someone brings you food like Dude, it's we... just like it's a it's a it's a feeling we're gonna be so thankful for that when that comes back 
did you did they let you eat inside or like did you yeah they let us outside? eat it they let us eat it inside but like everything's oh, wow. obviously spaced okay. out like we were yeah, in like a yeah. booth but like no one could sit in like the booths like around us and stuff like that yeah. so yeah but yeah i mean like for me like the biggest fear I, I know that stuff's fine and like i trust me like i've seen all my friends like i see what my boy isaiah harris is doing rob ford like those guys like obviously they're taking their uh, precaution but like you know they're having they're making the best of the moment um for me it's just been hard just because you know i'm in america i'm in a country that um isn't my own uh, obviously like the I, I would just say personally my canadian healthcare system is a little bit better for me if i <laughs> was on the other side of the border but um i think just too like there's so much uncertainty um it really scares me because you know, I, I haven't been to the Olympics yet. I, I, I feel like I haven't uh, hit my gear where I can say, like, I'm at my full potential. And it, it was kind of scary to kind of hear when um, they were saying that it's kind of one of those diseases that, you know, has an effect on your lungs, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, and exactly. um, I, I think, like, with hearing that and with all the uncertainty around it, it just, to me, I just see everything in life as a bunch of variables into you know contracting this virus and you know obviously certain certain variables are less lack, likely to contract it than other variables but the way i see it is like if i just take this variable out altogether then i don't have anything mm -hmm. to worry about so um i mean lately and my girlfriend jess uh she's been good she, she <laughs> she's been not eating out for five months and she hit her breaking point so like now she eats out and everything uh if she kind of wants to but um i'm slowly starting to kind of reincorporate like that stuff into my lifestyle um so i know you asked you asked me about running this could have been no, you're a good simple, easy it's question. all that's the thing like <laughs> oh and we talked about i talked about on the stream before like everything with running is like a 24 7 job so everything exactly what you're saying you're doing it affects, yeah. your, it affects what you're doing you're running and it's funny because like we were the same way like we were like like i was like i was ready for the apocalypse one like i was like one of those grocery <laughs> shoppers that was like going out and i was like all the rice we can buy all the water we can buy yeah. like i stocked up like crazy but then um it was scary when you saw Ari all got the like, yeah dog. dude when you see everything <laughs> gone it scares me more like like yeah. i didn't want to be like that dude who just goes and like buys the shelves out and i never did but i would be like every time i go to the grocery store i just grab like a box of pasta or a box of rice extra you know just to, like have it put away yeah. but i was like going to the grocery store like every couple times like a couple times a week just to, like make sure because it's like this could be the last time we go like they cut down grocery stores tomorrow and Ari's like, you gotta we stop. Ari's like, you gotta stop going. So I like stopped doing grocery <laughs> stores and like stopped going, but we like obviously eased back in and I had to move across the country. So like, yeah, I pretty much like fought too. off everything. Like I had to go into gas stations and get gas. Yeah. And food. Like I didn't I'm have, I stayed in a hotel. Yeah, I stayed in a hotel. Like I couldn't really like not do it. So like I had to face it, but no, like. Damn, so you you make me feel a lot better. Cause I see you here on this broadcast and stuff and you're smiling. You know, you haven't emphasized to me that there's anything wrong with you, so you're giving me a lot more confidence. Dude, we were, I was running, um, one of my friends when I got here, I'm old teammates, he helped me move in. And so him and I have been like running together because like we've been like, we've interacted or whatever. And we were running on a trail today and um, they, the people that run on trails that like cover their mouths and that are older and try to like be all scared of you, like you just shouldn't be on the trails, one. Like if you're that scared of getting yeah, it, you just old, shouldn't be out there. Yeah. Like, if you're going to go out and run on trails where it's like public use, like you have to realize you're taking a risk with that. Like you can't just completely Sorry. defend yourself. Yeah. You're good. But we passed this lady and she was like, Oh, I'm much better than the people you passed back there. And we're like, yeah, sure. Like we didn't really know what she was talking about. She's like, yeah, next time I pass those people, I'm going to spit right in front of them. I'm like, uh, Garrett, we, uh, we need to keep going. Here. Like just keep running past this lady. Like don't acknowledge her. I'm like, these are the crazy people. Who, like, yeah. just like, holy man. But There's dude, like it's a that, crazy like, time. It's extreme on both ends where they're just like, I'm gonna cough on you just to prove to you that you're not gonna get it. Yeah. Like, it's just like, how about you just chill? Yeah. <laughs> That's it's that crazy. funny. But yeah, I wasn't running on trails actually, just to kind of bring it back to running. Like I was running from my apartment. Um, I'm kind of near like a major intersection, so like there's sidewalks. There's sidewalks here, but like there it's a big intersection. So yeah. there's like either three lanes or two lanes and stuff like that so i've been running on the sidewalk and to be honest like uh, i was kind of bumping into these problems and i as of recently too it's like my plantar fascia and uh like my achilles and like around my ankle has just been like it's getting like little like really tender and like messed up and stuff so 
that's kind of part of the reason why I hopped back on the trails and I was just like, you know what? Like I'm trying not to get sick, but at the same time, I'm not trying to potentially injure myself to put myself even further behind. Yeah. So I had to balance that even like, um, you know, I, I haven't seen any personal trainers. I haven't seen my massage therapist in like five months. And uh, I'm in a position now where I'm just like, I feel better about things. And I know that, you know, there's, I don't, I wouldn't say laws, but instructions from the government that requires these people that would still work on you um, to wear masks or gloves or whatever. So like, I'm trying to kind of, kind of re- get into the habit of like rescheduling those appointments when I need them. So yeah, you caught me at a pretty, pretty good time in terms of like transitioning back to some sort of a norm. Yeah, that's how I am too. Like, I actually was like, I had like an Achilles soleus injury that happened right as like quarantine hit. So it was like extremely difficult for me to like yeah. get healthy because like in Portland, it was really bad about shutting everything down. And Ohio yeah. is a little bit more um, lax on as far as like PTs and massage happening. Like I didn't, I didn't see a PT or massage for like six weeks in Portland. And it was like the, the six weeks of like my injury where it was like very crucial for me to see somebody. So it was like yeah. extremely difficult to like kind of break that. And it was like, I was kind of just like not getting better, but I wasn't getting r- worse because I was doing everything on my own. Yeah. Like I was trying, yeah. but like you can only do fat so much tool. on like your Achilles and soleus. Is like, yep. the, like you can only cup it and like fat tool it yourself as an athlete so many times. Like <laughs> I know, you don't I know. know what you're doing. I don't know what I'm doing either. Like I'm yeah. just like, this feels like I'm hitting the spot. Yeah, exactly. And it wasn't getting worse, but it just wasn't getting better. But now I'm like, I'm back like you. I'm getting back to like running now, like consistency and like hopefully like, I'm, I, I have no idea where I'll be in like six weeks with like fitness wise and if there's races or not like what I'm gonna do because obviously yeah. like like you're saying like my health comes first and with it being like major championships yeah. the next four years like I'd much rather like make sure that I'm safe already safe my family's safe I like I'm yeah. healthy yeah. like versus trying to force like a, a race this fall but like it'd be nice yeah. to at least get out and like even well, if like it's like it's- a time trial like on a little like trail somewhere just to, like <laughs> know like if what I run like a thousand meters in on a, a gravel trail somewhere would be nice like in a couple months to be able to at least do that yeah i think like that's the hard part like even for myself like i've been solo doloing every single workout for five months and like clayton like let me tell you like if you don't know this about me like i am probably single-handedly the worst runner when it comes to working out by myself and i'm pretty comfortable with that statement like I remember even leading up to world champs in London. Uh, I, I went back home to Toronto for for like a week or so, just prior to prior to going to London and flying with Team Canada. And I had an easy workout. Like, let me tell you, I had to run like maybe like two twenty five or like two like something like that for an eight hundred. And I didn't have a lot of them to do. It's just like maybe two or three of them, and I could I couldn't even hit that. I was so bad, just like running by myself. And it just, it wasn't like reflecting that I was in bad fitness. It's just like in terms of hitting a pace, I've been so bad at that. But this is the one thing that like I I do take as a positive just from this whole quarantine and COVID situation is just that I'm being forced or more so by myself because my my teammates are working out together, but I'm working out by myself. But um, I'm putting myself in a position to get comfortable being uncomfortable and learning how to be the judge of the pace by myself, learning how to hold myself accountable Mm -hmm. uh, for the pace. And I I think like, you know, I always look at a a guy like Edward Cheserick, which I'm sure you've had the pleasure of racing a a bunch of times. And, you know, if you, if you look at his NCAA career, part of the thing that made him so tough to beat was, you know, he could beat you if he, let it all the way through at the gun. He could beat you if he ran like, you know, 36 second 200s and then decided to outkick you. And he could beat you if like midway through the race, he wanted to pick it up. So um, I always admired him um, in terms of the, his, uh, he was like a triple edged sword, if that kind of makes sense. So I think like, you know, I, I'm kind of known for having it, or I was known for having like a notorious kick at the end. Mm-hmm. And I think like to elevate my game, um, I think that this situation is almost like a blessing in disguise because uh, I'm learning how to be that guy that sets pace. I'm learning how to be comfortable with being the person at the front or even being in no man's land and just having to keep myself at my pace until I'm comfortable with moving up. So um, that's like the only positive that I guess I could kind of take out of this situation right now. 
Yeah, I mean, I know exactly what you're saying. Like the the motto of like comfortable with uncomfortable was like something that, especially with like yeah. my transition to Alberto and like his training was like, like I had to yeah. learn that very quickly. I mean, Alberto's training is like the basics of Alberto training is like how tough can you be? Like that's yeah. just like what he how he trains and like it's a very 5k 10k like mentality of like just tough 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 and so like it he transitioned it into my middle distance training which made it even like training for the middle distance and like trying to train for the 15 and the eight so trying to do fast fours fast twos as well as like strong k's and miles and tempos yeah like it was just like everything was like how tough can i be and like i think like my relation to that as well as like being uncomfortable was like can i get to three quarters of the race at like i'm like doing x way no matter what and then worry about the last like third or quarter of the race like when it comes yes. to it like and that's, it'll come that's like it'll be there yeah. exactly but like you have to get to three quarters of the race not only just in position but like it's like more than that like just so it's like it's almost like a force of the issue to like learn how to do it so it became super comfortable in like a in an uncomfortable situation like you were saying so it's funny it's like it's not funny but it's like it's well i guess it is funny how a pandemic is like inadvertently yeah. like helping you grow as an athlete and a racer <laughs> and like teaching you like more and more about yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in kind of, you know, everything happens for a reason. And, um, you know, even if we just focus on the pandemic at itself, it's just like there's so many things that, you know, you look at the world, you look at even at the grocery store when they wipe down uh, the conveyor belt or whatever it is. And like there's so many things that in terms of cleanliness, that should have been done before, but until like we've reached this point of desperation and despair is like, until we reach that point, like that, that's just stuff that just wouldn't have happened. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to compare this situation to nine 11, like it's completely different, but the only thing I can say about that is just like coming from nine 11, um, the airport security and everything was yeah. just completely different, completely different. And 100%. we would have never thought about that. And um, I think like moving on from this situation is kind of going to open our eyes on how to keep us safe and clean and stuff like that. And um, I, I just think that like our world's going to change, hopefully for the better. And uh, hopefully we can kind of get through this. No, I just agree. I had a conversation with somebody uh, when I was making the drive about how major negative events in the world always lead to at least some kind of positivity or like change that usually like Cause you're always trying to eliminate the next thing from happening whether it's like major wars or whatever like there's always something put in place or whether it's like somebody yeah. overtaking the the government and that's why democracy was put into place like there's all these major yeah. events that happen from like the start of human time and now like yeah. this pandemic is probably like the thing that really will like now that there's technology and tracking and testing that's truly really going to actually like help because there's going to be another like there's going to be another covid or another coronavirus that comes along in some kind of different form yeah. mutated and whether or not it's a flu strain or whatever it is but hopefully at this point like we'll know how to handle like a medical virus emergency pandemic versus like before exactly what you're saying like if there was a another terrorist type attack we'd at least know how to handle it and like move on from yeah. it and like so like no like and hopefully it's much like bigger. hopefully it brings the world even closer together because like to be honest like there's so many so many pandemics that like happen like I, I wouldn't say like yearly but like there's so much stuff that affects people at this magnitude that happens every year like whether it's a virus or you know governments or you know all sorts of issues and you know being north americans you know we're fortunate enough most of us to live in an environment where you know some of that stuff we kind of take for luxury and like even i remember like we lived through h1n1 we lived through sars we lived through mad cow disease and like all, they're all different diseases in right. terms of um you know your capability to kind of catch those but i think just like now as north americans we understand what it's like to kind of be in like a pandemic state and um hopefully like it can kind of show us empathy and like later on you know when we talk about like the black lives matter movement like hopefully it kind of shows people that you don't have to go through something to empathize for them. And um, yeah, we can touch upon that later, but that's kind of like my, my feeling towards that. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm like hundred percent standing uh, right next to you. So I want to touch on, we, we talked a little bit about uh, you bouncing back 
into like 2019 worlds into the indoor season being in the best shape of your life um let's go back to your transition from from syracuse to reebok um i had a couple questions about like why reebok uh what made you transition i think i know some of the reasons i know know a lot of the reasons but i think a lot of people are curious because like coming out as like like I said, one of the, the greatest Syracuse distance runner of all time, one of the best distance runners in the last decade in the NCAA system, NCAA cross country champion. I mean, I mean, you have the accolades. Me, man. <laughs> like, I, I mean, like, but I mean, like, I feel like the casual track fan would be like, why Reebok? And so I'm curious, yeah. like, I'm curious, like, what drew you to the to the brand, to the team? And obviously, you you stayed with your with the same coach, right? Yeah. And so yeah, you same. you pretty much just like relocated to a new to a new location. But like, yeah. other than the coaching aspect um which is a, a very crucial part of, of a successful as a professional what made you like work what, what made you comfortable with Reebok why the transition and, and talk a little bit about that I mean first and foremost like it it was a really 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 tough decision for me and I mean you saw me at the Nike headquarters and stuff like that yeah. like I, I showed up to you guys practice I, I loved hanging out with you guys like everybody on the team was cool um Galen it was fun seeing him he, he was running super fast that day. Like, <laughs> oh my God, I was, I was kind so of scared. So it's just a casual day at practice. It's just a casual day at practice, yeah. Galen. He, yeah, him, him and, uh, I guess you guys call him Sugar, right? Or at least Craig calls him yeah, Sugar. Yeah, Sugar. Yeah, Sugar. Yeah, he, he was, they were Zooming. I just never forget that. And then it ended up just being, I think you were working out. Um, You might have been working out, I don't remember. But I just remember it ended up being me and Craig. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I had a blast. Nike was like a great experience. They, um, I met, you know, I met coach Alberto. I met Pete Julian. Uh Oh, uh Oh, uh Oh, Hmm. Let's see if it comes back here. Uh, let's see if, uh, Mm-hmm. 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 TV comes back. Uh oh. Come on, man. Come on, Discord. Man, we're just getting into it. I'm sorry, chat. Dang. See if he calls back. I don't know if he lost service or his phone died, maybe. Hey, man, am I back? Yeah, I have you. Hold on. All right, we should be good. Should be good. Sorry about that, guys. No, we're good. We're good. We're good. Stuff on there too. But um, yeah, I'm sorry. I I don't know where I cut out, but basically, I was just saying like, I had a great experience at Nike. I met with Alberto. I met with Pete Julian. I met with um, you know, Jerry Schumacher, and I met with your team. Bowerman was in there and it was really hard for me because each coach, like I want to be a part of Jerry's group. I want to be a part of, you know, Pete Julian's group. I want to be a part of Alberto's group. I want to be in all these different places, but now I'm in a position where like you can only choose one. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, for me, I I feel like each coach, including my coach at Syracuse, obviously, because I ended up going with Reebok, but, um, they brought unique things to the table. Like the one thing I, I noticed about Alberto, like, he was very technical. Like even yeah. from me walking, he was showing me how, you know, sometimes I slouch or sometimes like, <laughs> which he's uh, not the first person to tell me that. Dude, but... don't get me into like Alberto's technicality <laughs> of like correcting you on like everyday life things. Like, man, I have, yeah. dude, I have some funny Alberto tech. We won't even, but dude, we have, I have some funny ones I need to share at some point. I bet. And I even have a funny, like, I guess it all ties in with the story. Like I remember when Nike was telling me that, uh, they set up the meeting with me to meet Alberto, and on, honestly, like I was scared. Like, dude, I you're not terrified want... to meet him the first time. <laughs> I was horrified. I, to, I was like so scared to meet the guy. 
because bro like the thing is for me like being being a fanboy like a high school athlete being yep. someone that was in college that only saw like the oregon project from what flow track or you know any of those free the service black jersey offer. the white skull like the yeah. quiet never the, seen like him, you never, never get a camera smile. inside practice like alberto doesn't talk to the media you think this guy is like you think you're just about to I sit at dinner so and just be like this you think you're gonna sit with your hands in your lap your knees shake like you're terrified to yeah. talk to him dude 100 percent. It, it, but it was so crazy because i was like shaking i remember meeting him for the first time and i was just like i've never seen him smile i've only like seen him like yelling to get you guys like to get where you need to go in the races and stuff and we had lunch and alberto is one of the funniest guys dude. i've ever met like he is so funny i have like a... it was so like <laughs> go dude, ahead he's go ahead. hilarious so i'm like on campus and i've just moved to portland and i've probably been there for like i don't know like uh a week or two okay so i'm just getting to know alberto we had lunch down at, in nike we go up to like the nike offices up in like mia ham where like the headquarters like, the nike running guys are all work and yeah. john caparotti's like in his office the nike vp yeah. <laughs> and uh alberto's like hey and this was like uh this would have been like 2017 pre-fontaine so i just started like transitioning yeah. i was like meeting there i was doing some workouts there and he's like hey go in there and ask cap to take a year off of pre-fontaine and run the boston boost games and he had this whole elaborate story for me to like tell cap specific <laughs> things like i like was getting this huge appearance fee from like the boston boost games like don't say adidas back like you yeah. don't really know what it is like all this stuff yeah, yeah. and alberto like told me all this stuff to say so i go to his office i'm telling cap all this stuff and cap just gets furious his like face is like beat red like he's about to like <laughs> call my agent and like cuss him out he's like screaming at me he's like screaming at like my Nike like representative sitting next to me that was who was in on it as well. But like yeah. finally we had to like, put Paul? it into it. Yeah, it was Paul. Finally I had to put <laughs> it into it. And like we look over in the offices and Alberta's like falling out of his chair, he's laughing so hard. Because he can just <laughs> see Cap's face and like how mad he is. And I'm like, dude, this dude is like supposed to be like this almighty like <laughs> god of coaching and he's over there like manipulating like a dude into yeah. like getting like his boss mad. Like Cap's technically yeah. like quote unquote his boss. <laughs> Like getting his boss yeah. mad i'm like no one else on campus has the poll like he does no not many people can do that and i love that like he knows like the power and like uses it for joy and stuff so yeah i mean he was great obviously like he has his own accolades as a coach and stuff too and um <laughs> i'm sorry i still can't get over that story that stuff <laughs> that's bad <laughs> funny but um yeah i mean i had a i met you guys trainer and stuff he was great um and i i really liked your team um it was just hard for me at the end of the day i think like sometimes we're scared of change and mm -hmm. uh i think like knowing coach fox and what he was about at syracuse and obviously the other thing too that you know for for the coll collegiate runners watching or high school it's not as simple as full scholarship half scholarship or no scholarship anymore like we're talking about you know money your that's livelihood. Gonna kind of, your livelihood yeah exactly so you know and, and to be honest both both sides were very respectful like i'm not gonna lie like it was that both sides were very respectful in terms of you know what they were offering me but um i think at the end of the day like i i love coach fox and he's been gr a great coach for me and um you know reebok they did a good kind of job of emphasizing that you know i was going to be their main guy and um they're building like a program around me, building like a running sort of reputation around me. And uh, I think like, you know, when you're given an opportunity like that, obviously like uh, it was something new. It, it's not like there was something that was set before I got there. And um, I, I ended up just going with Reebok because I, I, at that point in time, um, it was the, the best situation for me. Yeah, I mean, 100% agree. I mean, level of comfortability, it's your livelihood. You got to make a decision. And uh, yeah. I mean, it wasn't like you were deciding between two really bad decisions. I mean, you had two no. great opportunities. And <laughs> obviously, did. like, and if, if obviously, if like, you had. Nike, then it, yeah, you could have said Nike, the same thing. It would have been Bowerman or, or yeah, Alberto. Yeah, the same like, thing. Yeah. Been its own, its own yeah. ordeal. So. <laughs> oh, um, man. Who, who as a kid, I've seen this guy, I've, I'm looking through some of the Instagram Christmas you sent me as well as some of the ones that, that I got uh before we get into the black lives matter movement and like kind of talk about that a little bit uh we'll kind of wrap up the the main track stuff who was your biggest inspiration because obviously like you growing up you didn't grow up in like the track 
world as a kid. Yeah. You grew up in the other sports. Who was your biggest inspiration when it came to athletics as far as like a personal side as well as like who who was an athlete you looked up to as a young kid and then as you transitioned to the track, who became somebody in track that you started to look up to? Yeah. Yeah, so from from when I was young, you know, Michael Jordan was was my hero. And Which I think today I is the of... flu game, by the way. I don't yeah. know that. Oh, is it today? Yeah, today is the, the, the day in history <laughs> of the flu game. I saw that on uh, on Instagram today. I thought about it's that. So, I it's, it's so funny because in that documentary, like, we saw a lot of, you know, perspectives and, or I, well, I guess it was mainly Michael's perspective, but like we saw like a, a kind of like a deeper dive into the team. Um, I learned a lot more about Scottie Pippen than I could have ever imagined. Like, I, obviously, I knew what he was about, but I didn't know about him like that in his situation. But I, I liked how, like, they, or I, did, I guess I can't say I didn't like it. I thought it was kind of funny how, like, they played, like, Scottie Pippen, and then they they basically said, like, oh, he couldn't play, he had a headache. And then, like, Michael Jordan comes and, like, you know, whether it was food poisoning or the flu game, whatever, but, like, he ended up doing what he was doing. I thought that that was yeah. pretty pretty funny in a sense but um yeah michael jordan is the athlete that i've always looked up to even till this day um i think i kind of developed that inadvertently through through my father through my dad um he was a, a tremendous basketball player back in his day uh, i think he's like maybe an inch or two smaller than me and he could dunk he could throw down um at least back then he could like <laughs> now now I, I i can't see him dunking right now but um I just grew up watching Michael Jordan or at least clips of Michael Jordan with my dad. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I would like be sleeping on his chest, watching the game and stuff. And like, those are like kind of the little memories I remember having. And um, I remember like my parents, they, they gave me like a Michael Jordan Jersey and like the shorts. And like, that was my favorite thing to wear. I'd wear it to birthday parties. I'd wear it as my pajamas. I'd wear it if I was going out to dinner, like it was just my outfit to wear. And, um, I, I just always loved his mentality, like that killer mentality where um, you have no regrets. Like everything that you do is for the betterment of your team and yourself. And um, I think like that killer mentality, you need that to be um, a successful person in athletics in general, like whether or not you're trying to win a gold medal or whether or not you're trying to win the NBA finals, like you need to get to a point where you don't care what other people are doing, but you know what you got to yeah. do to be successful and to make the people around you successful. So um, that's kind of just this, the energy that I like to kind of have with me. And it's helped me a lot through a lot of different situations in life, whether I was at Syracuse or being a pro runner here. And um, I've always looked up to him for that. And then I guess like, I'm, I'm sorry, but I have, I, I can't leave my parents out of this because they're not, they're not athletes or at least my mom isn't, but um i've always looked up to my mom and dad and um you know my mom my i look up to them both for some similar and some different situations like my mom she's my hero she's from jamaica born and raised uh came to canada she didn't really come from much at all and um you know she worked hard and and you know she has a great job in the government very well respected in the canadian government um at the provincial level and um i I'm just fortunate because I've seen her go through so much stuff, make sacrifices and just for her to become, you know, the person who she is today. Um, that just goes to show that, you know, if you work hard enough, then you can achieve anything. And, um, you know, my dad's kind of the same way. Um, he was born in Canada, of course, but, um, one thing that I kind of learned from him is just like patience and, you know, sometimes you don't need to show all your cards. You don't need to show all your emotions. Uh, cause sometimes people use that, um, to get the better of you. But, um, I think like the main thing at hand is like, my dad's always shown me patience and kind of just, uh, he's always been very calm and assertive when he needs to be assertive. But, uh, I think like patience and the calmness to him is something that I've always admired. Nice. Yeah. I mean, respect. I mean, you can't, you can't argue with the Jordan. <laughs> you can't argue with the Jordan theory and to have parents yeah. that like you can lean on, like yeah, and continue to lean on. I mean, uh it's a very lonely world as a professional athlete sometimes and like to have parents that you can continually like lean back on more than just the people you see every day um you're you're, you're in an extremely great spot and it, it's cool to hear you are inspired by like your parents so much as well as like you could you could just like put yourself and like take things from such like a mis mystique of michael jordan and really yeah. able to like actually put it into like your everyday life yeah um, man 
it's it's it, i mean i do the same thing like with kobe like kobe's the same thing for me kobe like, kobe in a, is in, a, in a very similar but a different yeah. way like just the mom mentality is something that, like i've always adapted like i remember like you talk about the lunch table arguments like i was always the kid arguing for like kobe bryant versus lebron because like yeah. when that was like still a thing like i would say i just remember sitting on like I, I remember sitting on the steps of like my church as a kid in youth group, like arguing like till the end of youth group about how LeBron, <laughs> like how Kobe is like the better than LeBron, like and I, and and it's hard. To, I I can't sit here and say that like today, like as like an NBA player, like there's really like if you take stats and everything, like it's like, I don't believe it's like, it becomes believe like it becomes stuff. like whatever you want, like you can pick whoever yeah. you want, like between anybody, like MJ is probably the go, and then you go from there. But like for me, yeah. like the way that like. And I see it in LeBron too now as like a girl, like an athlete. And like, I see the way LeBron yeah. works and with social media, it's a lot more open. Like the amount of work yeah. that like those guys, like those three guys really put in. And I'm sure the entire NBA does the same. Tremendous. But Tremendous. like the way that they lead, the way that they take on young players, the way that they yeah. like, just like do everything they do. Like if you can take bits and pieces of that in any sport, like those are three of the guys that like are just like so easy. Yeah. If you're a young high school kid, like, look into like these guys and look at what they do and the mentality and how they handle themselves in the media and the press and and obviously like kobe went through things with like his life yeah. and like bounced back and even like guys like tiger woods who like went through like such a traumatic yep. like, such a bad part of his life and like bounced back into like what he is today and still is like a great role model yeah. to people in like the world of sports and has come back and like become the, a great athlete like he is i mean it's like it's awesome to see like those guys like be able to do that um yeah and the one thing, like, even about Kobe, where it kind of, it's always upset me, like, even, you know, may rest in peace, and, you know, that was hard for everybody. Um, you know, my brother was the biggest Kobe fan in the world, I feel like. But um, the one thing that always bothered me about, not Kobe, but, like, when people talked about him, I feel like when he retired, people forgot how great and unstoppable yeah. he was completely forgot as if like and uh, i see like when they, they were making lists of like you know the top five players of all time or whatever and like it's not even like people were putting him at three and to me like i just i'm like do you guys not remember all those nights crying because kobe blew up and like went for like 20 points in the fourth quarter and he just hit everything it's every double team yeah. and, every, and it it just really bothered me. I felt like I felt like the NBA did him dirty, and it's not even like he retired on a bad note. Like he dropped like what sixty one points his last yeah. game. It is insane. Come I on. mean, his last season I, was like. I mean, he was at a point in his career where like his body was like legitimately falling apart on him, yet he was still out there putting up sixty one points in his last NBA game. Like, I mean, bunch like, of bombs. Yeah, <laughs> with a bunch of bombs. <laughs> Dude, that, the things he did is like incredible. Um, but yeah. uh, let's talk about it. Let's let's get into this. Let's. Um, I wanted to make this. I want to allow you to have the platform here. Um, obviously you face things in your life via growing up as a black man in America that, that should not be that. And I have, it's, it's personal for me because, um, I soon want to be, um, the father of, of a son or daughter or many of them that they're going to be looked at yeah. as, as, as black kids in America and you have to grow up and there's things that need to be changed. Um, yeah. I want to allow this, like, I want to open it up to you at first to kind of like tell your story about, uh, coming from Canada and growing up here and the things that you kind of like, or the things you grew up or things you faced, like coming from Canada yeah. to here and stuff like that. Like what, just tell your story, some things and, and, and I'll just allow you kind of have the platform. We'll just go from there. Yeah. So, I mean, racism is just, is something that that's always existed. And to me, like, it's so hard. Like I don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. Um, when we're born as kids, we're not born to hate people. Like I even look back at when I was in junior kindergarten, senior kindergarten, I remember playing with my friends and, you know, you could visually see that people were different colors, but like you never, there was nothing more to it. You know, I, there, I didn't know them as being white. I didn't know people as being Brown. Like, obviously like I knew I was black and everything and like people are different colors, but like, there was nothing more to that. Like there wasn't like, Oh, I don't like you because your skin's lighter than mine or you know what I mean? So it, it's just hard because like people are taught racism and, um, I'll never forget. Like, I'm not 
people always kind of look at Canada and they're just like, you know, racism doesn't exist there. I, I, that's like a completely false statement. Um, the only thing I could say to that is that um, we don't like the consistency and the level of racism might not match, you know, what's going on in America, but like racism does still exist in Canada to this day. And um, for me, it was hard growing up. Like I grew up in a neighborhood with, um, with mainly Italian kids. Um, we had some Persian kids too, and a couple of black kids. And um, I remember like most of my friends were Italian. I, I was the only black person in my grade until around like maybe like grades grade five or grade six and um i just remember like a lot of my friends like were italian i used to go to their houses and you know their moms were nice to me their dads were nice to me their nonas which your grandma and italian and stuff were great and then eventually when i started growing up and i was you know sur surpassing that age of being cute um i noticed that like a lot of parents like they kind of they didn't see me the same way where um you know they would hardly talk to me like you know in terms of like playing outside with their daughters and stuff like that like that came to a complete halt and i remember growing up and just like wondering like why like why out of nowhere like there was no warning for it there wasn't like easing into it it was just like why all of a sudden are, are people treating me different and you know that was kind of hard to deal with i, I remember one of my one of my great friends, uh, his name's George. I don't, I don't know what he's up to nowadays, but uh, he's not a friend to me anymore. But this is a kid that was seen to be like as one of my best friends back in elementary school. Uh, he was Greek, and we went from like playing together, like hanging out together, great times, to all of a sudden, like I don't know if he like just dis discovered like the N word or something, but he would just say it to me and call me it to rile me up. And I was just like pissed off with him. Like the first time I was like, dude, what are you saying? Like, don't call me that. And I'm like in grade five or something. And then he would just keep doing it like every day, every day, just saying it like just to tease me. And that's just where my friendship finished because I was just like, this is someone that, you know, we were supposed to be best friends. And like, how could you call me such a hateful word like that and, and say it in such a way that's so hateful. And, um, you know, this never happened to me, but, um, I remember there was my, my other best friend in school. He was actually black. He was the second black person in my grade. And um, he was he was a little bit darker than me. And I remember one time I had to stay inside to finish up an art project. And um, he went outside to play with the rest of the kids. And the thing is, like, we weren't so segregated at school. Like, most of the time, everything was fine. But there was those one little moments where, like, a kid would just try to take it too far and just, like, be super disrespectful for no reason and um i remember him coming and running back into the school crying the teachers were trying to figure out what's going on and he wouldn't talk to anyone but me so i remember him talking to me and um he told me like we were there playing soccer outside everything was fine and then uh, the kids decided to form a circle around him and then he was the only person in the middle of the circle and then one person will call the N-word. And then he'll go over, like, to run up to that person and be like, yo, who are you talking to like that, whatever. And then someone on the other side of the circle will say the N-word. And then he ran to that side. And then, like, they just kept doing that. And, it, like, literally, and this kid was so strong. Like, he was tougher than me. And he, like, was breaking down crying. And I felt so bad. And, like, I never, like, intended to leave him alone. Like, I just had to stay inside because I had to finish our art project. But, like, I felt like, how could I have left him out there by himself where I shouldn't even have to feel like that? Mm -hmm. And, um, sorry, like, this is just stuff just to recap, like, some of the stuff that happens in Canada. Um, I think, like, you know, being a black man from Canada and moving to, to America, um... I can't say that at my time at Syracuse, at least coming to my, my mind straight off the back, that I've had many racial encounters. Um, you know, we had a lot of we had a lot of African Americans or black people at our school. Um, it was our our cross country team wasn't diverse. I was the only black kid, but like I was I was close with the track guys, and 
to be honest, like when you run distance, like you kind of get used to being like one of the only black kids on a team, whether you're on Team Canada or Syracuse or not. And um, I think like more so now since moving down to Virginia, um, I've felt an overwhelming amount of just racial tension here. Um, I'm based in Charlottesville, Virginia. I don't know if you knew that, but like, I, I think like it was maybe like three years ago, there was like a huge riot here with um, uh, like white supremacists and stuff like that. And I'm not going to say that like Charlottesville is like, like a, I hate to like kind of generalize it, but I don't put Charlottesville in the same category as like a Mississippi or, you know, certain pockets of Georgia. But at the same time, like a lot of the people, you know, kind of have those racial tensions where, um, you know, for example, I'm in an interracial relationship myself. Uh, my girlfriend, she's Italian. And um, I find myself going going out to dinner with her, like taking on our date nights and, you know, dress up. She likes to, you know, take pictures or like dress up and go to dinner. And it doesn't matter how I look, whether, you know, I have a buzzed haircut or if my hair is growing out, if I'm wearing jeans and a button up polo. Um, I just feel like when I go to those restaurants, like a lot of the times people kind of stare at me, like, why, why are you here? And like, why are you guys kind of together? And, um, one experience that I've had here actually is I was, uh, I was at a winery with, uh, one of my best friends from Syracuse, Robbie Hall. And, um, I wasn't drinking. I was in season. I just took them to be like the designated driver. And as soon as I, I come to the winery, we go inside and um, there's a, a security guard, which is kind of strange, but there's a security guard standing right there with his sunglasses on with his hand on his gun as soon as I walked in. Yeah. And then for me, like I was kind of shocked because I was just like, well, first of all, why is there like a security guard here? And why is there <clears throat> one with his hand on his gun? And we walked, we proceeded outside uh, to the kind of backyard of the winery where like they give you wine and stuff and the security guard he follows me and we're at like the bar area now where you're like testing the wine and I'm just drinking water standing with my friends talking with them and he stands right in on the opposite side of the bar staring at me with his hand on his gun and then like they noticed like I was like what's going on like I, I was uncomfortable um I ended up going to the bathroom he followed me to the bathroom and then I came out of the bathroom and he's standing right there with like his hand on his gun. Yeah. And then like, literally I go back outside and this is something that literally lasted for an hour and a half, two hours. And for me, it puts me in a situation like not only, not only am I like in the South where like, you know, people can carry if they want, but like, if I react the way that I'm feeling like infuriating, then he's going to see me as a threat. And then he has his hand on his gun already. He's prepared. And I don't want to be that person that ends up on the news. And you know what I mean? And it just hurts because like, I'm in a situation where I'm not doing anything. I'm not, you know, bothering anyone. I'm not behaving any sort of way. You're wine tasting. Which you're wine tasting with your friends. Like, yeah you're at a winery so much, you're at a winery like winery like am i gonna rob you of your grapes or something like in I, the middle of the I day don't know. like like i mean it's just it's so sad and like to be honest living in virginia has been hard for me because i've had those situations when kamoi was here and like i liked i loved having kamoi here because he was another black person like i could vent to him he could vent to me i i felt a little more comfortable like there's not a lot of black people here at all Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with all races, but you know, sometimes it's, it's nice to have, you know, someone that you can vent to someone that, yeah. you know, is treated the same as you. And, um, you know, he wasn't there. He was, he's not here anymore. He's in Miami. And I remember one situation, the first week I got here and I went on a run with the team and, um, this homeless lady, mind you, she was homeless, but I never had a homeless lady yell anything at me before or anything like this, but she was yelling hateful stuff at me and Kamoy calling us the N-word like at least six times <clears throat> on our way out. And then when we passed her again, she called us the N-word like 10 more times, like extremely hateful, like yeah. telling us that she hopes we die and stuff like that. And being from Canada, like I've never been in that situation in my life. Like there's 
racism that ha- happens, like whether or not you're like getting hired at a certain job or like if people cross the street because they don't want to be walking on the same street as you. But I've never had someone like kind of get in my face calling me such hateful words. And I, I've seen it like obviously like it's stuff that happens. But like for me to be put in that situation, like I was like, we're in 20, 2019. Like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. I couldn't believe it. And um, it's just uncomfortable. And like for me, um, I find myself it's it's really hard because I want to enjoy myself. Like everybody else on my team loves Charlottesville. They think it's great. They like the wineries. They like apple picking. They like exploring. But I feel like I don't I don't get that. Like mm. I'm I'm always uncomfortable <clears throat> every time when I go outside because you know, people treat me a certain way or, and sometimes I don't go outside because I I just feel like, do I really want to go through that treatment? Like there's always the possibility of that. And, um, it's hard because like, as you know, like when you have a wife, a girlfriend, like you want to do stuff with them, you want to explore the world with them. You want to enjoy time with them. And currently right now, like where I'm living, it's like, I feel like I'm very limited because I don't want to put myself in a situation where, I know people will be hating on me just because of the color of my skin. And um, I think like that's just kind of something that that's hard. And um, I know that, you know, there's people all across America who have known that as being the norm from when they were young based off of places that they're living. But it it just infuriates me. Like, I I don't I'm sorry, I'm kind of rambling now and I don't even know where I'm kind of going with this, but. I, I just don't, I don't understand what black people did as a race. Like sometimes like, you know, I'm, I'm very, like, I'm religious. I, I'm Christian, went to a Catholic school. And sometimes like I, I find myself, you know, asking God in these moments, like why, what did we do to deserve to be treated like this for like hundreds and hundreds of years? Like what, what did we do? And I mean, I kind of see the world right now. Um, I'm appreciative for people going out and voicing their opinion. I see like a lot of the crowds when they're marching and peacefully protesting or just protesting in general, like it's very diverse. And I'm thankful that, you know, it's not only the black community, but there's also people of other cultures, other races that are standing with us and find that it's not appropriate anymore. Like this has to end. And um, my personal opinion, um, I'm not sure if this is something that can be solved in a couple of years, I think, or even in our generation, to be honest, I think that things can be put in place to make things better. But the only way to kind of beat this oppression and this mistreatment of people of color is for parents to teach their offspring. It's not good enough to not be racist around your kids or be mindful of what you're saying around your kids. I don't, that's not enough. I think people need to teach people to love and to embrace other cultures and to find the similarities with other cultures because we can all relate to each other. And I think until society reaches that point where it's not enough to just not be racist around people or not say inappropriate things, I think we got to teach each other to love other cultures for us to grow as, um, as human beings. And I mean, I can, I can kind of leave it off to you. It's just a hard topic. I don't know. I don't know where to start. I don't know where to end, but, um, that's just kind of some stuff that I've been going through around, around here. No. Yeah. I appreciate like hundred percent you sharing and I hundred percent agree with you. Like, it's just like bigger than like what, like one conversation and like one, one time and like one protest, like this goes on for like, for generations and I, I 100% agree with you like it's more than just saying like you're not a racist as a parent or as a kid or as a young adult like it's about like not seeing like it's about seeing other cultures and respecting other cultures and not necessarily just saying like oh I'm, I'm not racist I'm colorblind I don't see color like no you need to respect other like all cultures and all people and respect them for who they are and treat them as equals and and if you're not going to be a part of the black community yeah. by like if you're just gonna if you're just gonna be like a part of your own culture like that's fine but just respect the other cultures and understand who they are and and what they deserve is is to be equal with you and, and that's, that's what 
this country and this world should be is like loving and equal quality. And you kind of touched on yeah. it a little bit about like, just like what they can do and how it's bigger than like just now, um, as far as like changing generations. What do you think like, other than going and doing like some like peaceful demonstrating and posting on social media, what can like we do as like, has people now to help with the immediate fix of this is it is it about just continually like educating people is it more than just that and then when you're and you're done with that what can particularly can the running community do because it is such a diverse i mean we just saw it with brown track and field and like yeah. how like they quote unquote cut their team for diversity yet track and field is the most diverse sport i mean period like it's the it's the worldwide sport it's a sport that, that started in 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 it's the olympic sport that brings everybody together and it doesn't matter if you're six foot five yeah. and 300 pounds or if you're if you're four foot five and 100 pounds you can compete in track and field and it doesn't matter whether you're white black mexican it doesn't matter like your race or where you grew up or egypt i mean the akron track team has i mean there's like there's a, yeah. like a japanese um egyptian kazakhstan um canadian i mean yeah. every there's every culture is, is represented yeah. in track and field like what can we do in the running community to to kind of be maybe the forefront leaders of that yeah i mean first and foremost i think as society um what, what i'd like to see from black people in general is more more so supporting each other and uplifting each other um i i think that there's a lot of situations where you know, a certain amount of black people, or not a certain amount, but some, some, not all, find them in a path where they, they succeed and, you know, they make it out or, you know, and they, they do they do well in life. And I, I feel like we should all support each other. We should support each other's businesses. We should support each other's dreams. We got to, you know, if you make it out, you know, of a bad community, you still got to give back to give other kids that opportunity. Yeah. Um, I think... It's something, you know, even, you know, spreading knowledge, like even for everyone, I think that learning about black culture and, um, you know, what we've done for society is something that's really, really important. There's so many stories that are just almost forgotten or just left out of history. I mean, I, I was on Twitter yesterday and I, I'm thankful that Twitter exists because I'm even I'm learning so much about the black community in america like i didn't know that central park was uh actually home to a, a very like very successful black people until like you know they stripped them of their their land and stuff i have to read more about it about that but like that's one of the situations that you can read up about and then you know even i've, I've seen stuff about what happened in tulsa like there was a very prominent black community there and you know i, I have to read more about it but there's so much moments in history that are just forgotten whether we were successful or whether we were completely oppressed and i think like that's am i am i working no no you're good it was my headphone okay it was fine no, no worries so i think like that that's stuff that we all i think like that needs to be included into an important part of history like there's so many black inventors that you know there's a lot of stuff that we use in everyday life where it's just like you wouldn't even know that it was a black person that invented it and i think like we need to be given praise for you know the positive stuff that we've done for the world and for our community i think uh educating ourselves and like this is one thing i went back to my high school and you know a lot of the black people that went to my school are you know, on scholarship or bursary and like, they fully deserve to be there because, you know, they, they show that they're tremendous students. They're not just there for athletics or anything. And I remember, you know, a, a kid complaining to me and saying like, uh, I don't necessarily remember exactly what he's complaining about, but he was just emphasizing to me that, you know, it's not fair that, you know, his white friends are rich and stuff like that. And I, I, I had a great talk with the kid because I was like, well, look at yourself. Like, you know, you, you've explained to me where you're from, you know, your family, but would your mom, your mom and dad, like they never had an opportunity to go to private school and look how like somehow they found a way to give that to you. And you might not have everything you want right now, but it, you know, if you use your education and find a way to be, be successful, then you can, put your kids in a better position than where you are. And that's kind of where 
generational wealth kind of starts and it's, it's hard for a lot of people to kind of see it. You know, we, we always look at the stuff that we don't have, but we, we got to start thinking like, you know, what can we do? Like we might not have it all now, but how could we make the people that come after us to live a, a more fruitful life? Um, in terms of the track community, uh, there's a lot to be done. Like I, 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 I don't even have the answer for that, to be honest. Um, I just remember even like last year I went to Ireland and this is what I want to actually really touch upon. This is not just an American problem. Yeah, like the sure. mistreatment of black people. I mean, like, you see it in every 50 States. There's, there's protests and in countries across the world, there's people stepping yeah. out and, and, and speaking up on this. And, um, I think a lot of people who, cause I think the issue with this is, is it, is you become so narrow-minded that you like don't see the other cultures and you you claim you're not racist but you're so narrow-minded that you are inadvertently just like uneducated and don't know what you're talking about and you speak on the wrong yeah. things and one of the things that people keep speaking on is like that like oh it's like such a minor issue like we'll just put in some laws or we'll just do this or like we'll just like listen to some protests and we'll be fine but like dude this is a worldwide issue and it's so much bigger worldwide. than what you're saying and like i 100 percent agree with you on that and i to share another story i remember we me my brother uh you know rob demana came with us uh rob ford was there isaiah harris was there um we were in ireland and there's a lot of others julian oakley there's a bunch of guys great group of people and we were in ireland and i'll never forget we were literally in dublin close to the airport, close to the city. And we were just casually walking. It was me, uh, my brother, Isaiah Harris, Rob Ford. And I believe Rob Domanic was there too. And these kids across the street, we weren't doing anything. We were literally walking 50 meters to get back to our hotel. And these kids across the street, they started staring at us like out of hate. Like you can tell yeah, like these kids tell, were looking yeah. at us like they, and then we we started looking at them because like we were confused. We're like, are they looking at us or is there like something around us? And then they started yelling at us, calling us the N word, saying like they're gonna come beat our ass and stuff. And I was just like, all of this for what? For just because you see black kids mm -hmm. walking down the street? Like we weren't even talking to you. We didn't start staring at you guys. Like you guys are the ones. That I mean, I'm sure their parents were the same way. I mean. It, yeah, you know, those kids have obviously seen that somewhere. You don't just randomly like, you don't just randomly as a a six year old like, ten year old like become like hateful like that. You see, you they've seen that. You know, like they've grown up yeah. with that. They like, and that goes back to your original point of like, it's so much bigger than like putting some laws in place or like the immediate like learning and the immediate hey. like I'm not a racist anymore. Like posting on yeah. social media like. Like just because you're like, like white and you participate in, in in Blackout Tuesday and you're like, all of a sudden like understanding Black culture and reading up on it doesn't mean anything that if you like if you like the next generation like you don't educate and you just go back to your ways and like you lie your kid to kind of learn from them because just because you do it doesn't mean that your neighbors doing it and the kids yeah. that your neighbors are raising are gonna grow up like your kids like that's why to me like I think like. Yeah. You gotta raise your the next generation to, like the right way. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're just like leave them open to be those kids that are gonna be hateful yeah. for for no reason. Yeah, and to be honest, I think I think both governments in North America, being Canada and America, they kind of go about things wrong. Like where they think that they're trying to do us a a kind gesture. Like you know, <clears throat> sometimes companies say that we're looking specifically for a black person to hire, and you know, that's great and all, thankful for that opportunity. But then what it causes is people to have hate because they're like, oh, this guy's getting the job. He doesn't deserve it over me. Yeah. He's just getting it because he's black. And then the other problem with that, to me, I don't think it's like, like, yes, giving us the job and holding us up to a certain standard is very important. But instead of just saying, okay, we'll hire three of you guys. How about we put money into the schools, into the neighborhoods, that are completely deficient and are not receiving the funding that they deserve to help them become at a level where they could work for it and be and not to say that and I, I'm not trying to say it the, the worst way and I, I feel bad if I'm I'm not doing a good job articulating this but I think like 
it's not something that you can fix by just being like, oh, you're black here, take this job. Like, we want to work for it too. We're not lazy people. We want yeah. the same opportunities as everybody you just have, else. You just want to be able to have opportunities. Yeah. Like, and you want to have opportunities think, to work for it. Yeah, and I think, like, putting monies into schools that need it and they need funding will help. Like, it's not that these kids are dumb. Some of these kids are extremely smart, but they're in schools and in situations where they're not – being given justice to learn to learn and i think it's very sad and i think that's where the government means needs to start at least pouring more money into schools so that these kids can learn and be successful and can have a shot because a job can be available but if you're if you didn't learn them like material or you're not qualified to get that job like what good does it do like give them a, the opportunity from when they're young yeah i mean I think we both agreed to here it's much bigger than than yeah than uh than a conversation that we can have right tonight and uh it's an issue that should continue to be in the forefront for for years and years more than just like i keep seeing people saying like don't let this drop off like it's been a week it'll fall out of the media cycle like this is much bigger than a media cycle or the next media cycle or even the next presidential election like this is something that grows until our generation starts raising the next generation and then yeah. they're going to become young adults when they can make decisions for themselves. Um, but I, I, I yeah, yeah, go ahead. I mean, if you have anything else, I mean, go ahead. I, I was just going to say the like what I want to end this topic on is like the most important thing is to teach love. Like you got to love people for who they are. Like I get it. Some people, they're very hard to trust. Some people in life, like you have to prove to them that you're worth it, but you can't live life like that in all areas of life. Like you have to learn to love. You have to learn to give people the opportunity. And m most importantly, like this is not even mainly a, a black lives matter. Like it is a black lives matter thing, but like this can apply to so many different things. Like you can't live your life fearing someone, you know, fearing someone that you don't know. And the last thing I want to say just about that was, um, you know, moving to America, I, I kind of told you, like, when I was younger, I grew up around, like, Italians and, like, a lot of Persians. Yeah. And, like, there was some black people in my neighborhood. And um, the Persians, like, a lot of my best friends were Persian. I'd go to their house. I'd, you know, embrace their culture. Um, I noticed that, uh, you know, they're Muslim and they pray to Allah. But more or less, like, I say prayer before dinner. They said prayer before dinner. At such a young age, I was learning so much stuff that, like, I was learning how similar our cultures were. Like, even though I was Christian and they were Muslim, like, they were very similar. It was just, like, a minor details that were, like, very different. And I never grew up fearing Muslims, like, ever. Airport, whatever. Like, I never grew up fearing any Muslims because I grew around them. I know that they're good people. There's yeah. good Christians. There's bad Christians. There's good Muslims. There's bad Muslims. Whatever. And I got to America... And, like, mainly, like, in, I mean, right away when I got into college and, like, some people would just, like, express, like, a fear of, like, a certain culture without knowing anything about it. And I think, like, that was the one thing about Canada, which I really liked, was that I've experienced all these different cultures. And the reason why, like, I love these cultures and I'm not fearful of most of these cultures is because I knew these cultures from when I was young. I grew up with them. So I know them as good people. So... I think that's like another thing that society can improve upon. I don't know how, but I think that's very important as well. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing. Um, I mean, it's like, it's tough to hear those things and like the things that you go through even to this day of like, um, I mean, I love wine. I mean, I've been wine tasting many times in my life. Yeah. And I've obviously never had a police officer once like hold his gun the entire time I was wine tasting. And oh I can never God. imagine the situation where like I go in there and, and, and being with Ari and her being like profiled the same way you pretty much were. I mean, there's no way. Yeah. Around. I mean, things, things like that are just, it's incredible to hear. And I appreciate you sharing. Um, and I'm glad yeah, we're yeah. able to kind of have that conversation. Cause like, I mean, something that that's going to continue on like i said so is there anything else on that topic or anything else that that you want to touch on before we kind of wrap up here i mean we really yeah. touched on a lot from like how you yeah. picked Kawhi leonard over lebron james currently <laughs> for your mount rushmore i mean we'll go back to that i mean how you picked the bucks over the lakers i mean 
<laughs> we won't disagree I mean, with that I, one. We'll agree to disagree, I guess. We'll agree to disagree. We'll agree to disagree. We'll agree to disagree. Maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll do a revisiting. We'll do a we'll do an NBA stream after as the playoffs pick up or something. Maybe we'll maybe we'll start doing up. like a maybe we'll start doing like a weekly <laughs> like a couple of days we'll get on in here and start talking the NBA or something. But uh, I can I can be Stephen A. You could be Max Kellerman. Can, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it going. Game analysis and everything. But yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate you coming on, man. I appreciate you you sharing your stories from the time you were in tenth grade and uh, how you sucked at gym and became uh, now a two time world champ or world championship qualifier and, and running and you sucked at gym class and uh, sharing your stories as far as like uh, growing up as a black man in Canada and then coming to America and facing um, really tough things. Um, I appreciate you you giving your time on an evening and uh, sharing your stories and, and hanging out with us for having me Clayton I, I think like it's great what you're doing here you know you're bringing the track community a lot closer you know a lot of people they look at me and you and like they see us as competitors they see us as guys that line up against each other and like maybe don't like each other and just want to beat one another but you know my relationship with Clayton Clayton is one of the people that I actually looked up to I couldn't claim that when uh when he asked me who I looked up to and stuff I didn't I actually didn't name a runner but you know, Clayton, Clayton did remarkable things when he was in the NCAA and I was a big fan of him. And I'll never forget you talking to me for the first time and uh, kind of the friendship that kind of stemmed there. And, you know, honestly, like we don't we don't talk as often as, as we should. And I don't do that with a, like a lot of my friends, you know, you know how yeah. busy schedules and stuff like that go. But um, I think what you're doing here, just kind of creating a platform to kind of bring the running community closer for those who are interested in the relationships that come. And uh, I think this is kind of showing runners that, you know, you can line up against somebody and want to beat them. You know, I'm sure Clayton, next time he lines up to me, he's going to want to kick my ass and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and embarrass me, make me look like a 68 in gym class all over again. But, <laughs> next time uh, I pass you to race, I'll be like, yo, 68, yo, 68. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think like, you know what, what you're doing here it kind of shows people the beauty of track and the friendships that you create off the track and you know hopefully this encourages others to you know enjoy enjoy the process of being great enjoy the process of competing but after that you know these friendships these relationships they last a lifetime and they last longer than your track career will last so you know i applaud you for kind of bringing us together on a on a platform where others can watch us just casually talk and you know hopefully we can do this again man yeah, I appreciate it, man. Hey, thanks for coming on. Uh, have a great night. And uh, we'll talk soon for sure. We'll talk soon for sure. All right, man. Talk to you later. Yeah. Oh, chat. Well, I lost the uh, thing and I can't pull up my webcam because uh, it's stuck in um, in Discord. So I'd have to restart the stream to really get it um, to get the, the webcam working. Oh, maybe, maybe I can do it real quick here. Um, let's see, chat. Just a second. I just want to wrap this up real fast uh, with you guys. Um, here we go. All right. Oh, yeah, yeah, we got it. Okay, we're going to be stuck in the middle here. That's fine. It's fine. Not a big deal. I appreciate everybody hanging out tonight. Um appreciate you guys uh asking your questions on twitter or uh, instagram prior getting the questions in while we we're there i know we didn't get to some of them we didn't get to uh justin's decathlon um we didn't get to what he thinks he can score in decathlon um but yeah i appreciate you guys hanging out um we're gonna be back next week got a couple of guests in mind need to reach out and uh, line up the next guest but we'll have somebody on next week and uh if you have somebody that you want to have on let me know um message me on instagram join the discord link we kind of we we have a good community started there in discord and uh appreciate you guys all hanging out um continue to be continue to support it um make sure you hit the follow link if you're not followed to go to next time that uh next time i go live make sure you hit the follow link um there is a subscribe button had a bunch of followers tonight slim shady with the follow egg with the follow anthony with the follow gillette me finish the follow I appreciate you, Ryan Ardle, for the sub tonight. I'm um, sorry I didn't get to you earlier. Just letting Justin really kind of have that and 
most nights like this, I, I pause the alerts and, and really just like to focus on the, the athlete at hand. Um, but yeah, I'll probably maybe hop on. I don't know if I'll hop on stream tomorrow or Saturday. Um, kind of busy a, a little bit over the next two days, but we'll be back Monday night with, uh, we'll do some track talk. We'll go over to some races. I'll think of us a theme for, for Monday for us to kind of chat about, and then I'll play some games. Um, but thanks for hanging out chat. I'm going to get off for the night and grab dinner. Didn't get to eat before. So thanks for everybody hanging out. Appreciate it. And, uh, this will be up on YouTube and I'll probably rip the audio and throw it on a podcast as well. So I'll work on that, um, tomorrow and get that up. So thanks chat. I appreciate it. And, uh, have a good night, have a great weekend and, uh, stay safe.